<laughs> in terms of technology, I'd like to tell you about my favorite project, which happens to be also the most simple. It began about eight years ago when I started growing a vegetable garden in my front yard. I wanted to grow a couple of cucumbers, tomatoes, just a couple of random herbs. I made sure that no animals were going to come and attack my vegetables. But as it turns out, it wasn't actually the deer that I needed to worry about. It was a toxin called arsenic. Because the wood that was lining my vegetable garden actually was laced with this arsenic as an insecticide. In the same year that I began that vegetable garden, the United States actually banned the production of this wood. They ran a whole awareness campaign around the health effects associated with the, with the lumber. And I started reading more and more about it, ran a back of the envelope calculation, and actually found out that there was enough arsenic to kill 200 healthy adults in just the lumber around my vegetables. And my family only had five people. <laughs> so this wasn't a good thing. We switched it over to a nice little picnic area instead, moved the vegetables, and my family is here today, so I think that they're healthy <laughs> as far as I know. But the problem still stuck in my head. So when I actually would go on Google, I started thinking, you know, looking up arsenic in wood, arsenic in vegetables, arsenic in health. I just wanted to learn more about the problem. But what I found out had very little to do, what I learned had very little to do with the lumber in the United States and had a lot more to do with the drinking water problem in Bangladesh. I'm embarrassed to say that at the time, I probably couldn't have located Bangladesh on the map. I wouldn't have been able to tell you that it's the most densely populated country in the world. And I certainly couldn't have told you that it's grappling with the largest mass poisoning in history. Over 70 million people are currently drinking arsenic-contaminated water. That's equivalent to the entire population of the United Kingdom forced to drink poisonous water. So as I continued reading about this problem, I couldn't stop. I just kept Googling and looking up more stories. But it wasn't actually the pictures of the arsenic patients or even really the scope of the problem that affected me the most. It was actually the technology that was being proposed and implemented. I saw pictures of large metal vats that required a constant supply of electricity, very skilled technicians to operate. And the worst part, it would actually produce an arsenic sludge that would just get reintroduced back into the environment. To me, that didn't seem like it was really solving the problem. It seemed like, it seemed like an engineer had, 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 had condensed the problem down to, here's dirty water, and here's safe water. And completely ne neglected the fact that eventually it had to go in someone's backyard. And over time, if the money dries up or if the skilled labor doesn't know how to maintain the system, eventually those big metal vats become rusted and useless. And over time and time again, these projects failed. So not surprisingly, there's been a lot of effort in designing better arsenic filtration systems. And it's important that you say arsenic filtration system because arsenic is not something that can be filtered out with a typical system, a typical filter. In fact, it's actually very, very dangerous on a small concentration. To give you an idea, if I took one drop of water and that were to represent arsenic and I diluted it in this entire swimming pool, the World Health Organization would consider it unsafe for human consumption. <clears throat> so when you go about thinking about how you can actually filter water, how do you filter this arsenic out, there are basically two main methods. Either you create a membrane and you push the water through and only the water goes through and the impurities stay on the other side, but that, that requires a lot of energy. The other method is to take advantage and exploit the chemical properties of arsenic and then selectively remove that arsenic from the drinking water. Now, the latter option is actually a lot cheaper and more appropriate for Bangladesh where the main contaminant is arsenic. So then I began the research and thinking, you know, what are the, what are the metals, how, how can you go about filtering heavy metal contaminants? And there's uh, coagulation, flocculation, adsorption, a lot of big names, but the one that really stuck out was called phytoremediation. It's the use of a plant to rapidly accumulate a heavy metal toxin. Why not let nature solve the problem? And the big breakthrough came when this plant was discovered living in the harshest environments. It was living right on the edge of a mine tailing where arsenic and sulfur was being mined. It lived in an area where no other plant could survive. And I asked the question, is it possible to take this plant and produce a, a drinking water filter? It would be ultra low cost, it would be environmentally friendly. It wouldn't require any electricity. Hell, it'd probably be even really simple to operate. So I actually you know, went to my parents and said, do you think I could borrow some money and buy some plants and grow them in my basement? <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, <laughs> and to my surprise, they said yes. <laughs> 
And um, <laughs> so when I started putting these, uh, these systems together, I had, the first step I had to do was convert them to hydroponics. So I had to actually remove all of the soil content. I washed off all of the soil, and it was just the roots that were exposed. And I delicately took those roots and pulled it through little plastic baskets and put them in, in that blue bin that you see. And then I created a nice environment where there was oxygen and water, and I added some nutrients. But after a few weeks, it actually failed. These plants started to fall over and, and die. They, they looked like they were just completely gone. In fact, there's actually this white deposit on the underside of them. And I thought, this is ridiculous. These plants are supposed to live in the harshest environments. I'm just putting them in water. <laughs> and and uh, so I took it to an expert. And they said, actually, you're, you're overfeeding the plants. You're giving them too many nutrients. And those are actually salt deposits on the underside of the fronds. So then I went to the reverse extreme and basically said, OK, I'm going to take away all the nutrients. And I'm, I'm just going to continue uh, you know, doing business as usual. And to my surprise, they, the plants actually grew three times faster. The roots ended up filling the entire bucket, and the green fronds exploded. So then when it was time to actually go about you know, seeing if they can absorb arsenic, I packed up the old 1984 Volvo, drove right up to the local university, started an experiment. At first, I started giving them a little bit of arsenic. They absorbed it. Gave them a little bit more. They absorbed it. Gave them a lot more. They continued to absorb it. To the point where we were able to actually design a filter that can produce clean drinking water at a rate of about half a liter a minute. And not only that, I wanted to push the limit. I wanted to see how long can these plants continue to operate? How long can they do this? And over time, it realized that the plants continued to absorb the arsenic. Not only did they absorb it, they actually absorbed it through the roots, shot it up through the stems, and then stored it in those green leafy bits. And they stored it in such a way that it was in that hard-shelled vacuole. So actually, that when it rains, when you touch it, you don't actually get contaminated by this, this arsenic. And not only that, it actually thinks that it's a nutrient. It treats it as though it's a nutrient, so it wants to preserve that arsenic. It wants to hold on to it. It took a lot of energy to absorb that. So as a part of the plant falls and dies, it'll actually move the arsenic to a healthier part of the plant, and that concentration continues to grow to the point where almost 2.5% of the overall weight of that plant is just arsenic. So now that takes me back to where these plants were discovered in the first place, an arsenic mine. I thought this was a destructive element. Actually, it turns out there's a very productive use. It's used in semiconductors, solar panels, maybe even iPads. They're probably not the iPads that Tom was talking about earlier. <laughs> but, um, but they're consumable electronics. And this is actually, this arsenic is mined every day. The process that they do is they go into old sulfur deposits, which is about a 12% abundance of arsenic. They take that arsenic in the sulfur. They put it in a furnace about 960 degrees Celsius. It cranks up. The arsenic turns into a gas. They capture that gas. And then that gas is used for these semiconductors. So I thought, if I have these mines that are 12% abundance of arsenic, and these plants that have about a 2.5% abundance of arsenic, and if we spice up the, splice up the plants you know, in a specific manner, we can actually increase that concentration, it would actually be viable to recycle that product and recapture the arsenic, turn something destructive into something productive. So that's what I ended up doing. So in the laboratory is at the Naval Research Lab and the University of Oxford, I was able to create a system where we can actually liquidate the saturated plants, turn it into this green jelly, if you will, then add a catalyst and actually create that same exact gas that is used in the semiconductors. Not only that, we were able to actually generate close to $85 of revenue for every filter that we put in the field. So the next question is, let's take it to the field. <laughs> so when I was packing up, my, packing up my car, ready to drive to the airport, I actually had a little bit of a crisis. I was wondering, am I repeating the same exact mistakes of the engineers I had criticized earlier? Had I just designed this really cool technology and find out that I had just completely neglected the people who were actually going to use it? and hadn't taken them into account. Someone the day before I left to ask me, how are you going to convince someone that a plant is absorbing arsenic? And I actually had to think about it. You know, the water tastes, looks, and smells exactly the same as before you filter it. So there I was, left completely at ground, you know, just bottom, thinking, oh, no, like, I'm going here. It's a total unknown. But I go to the, I go to the village, and I end up setting up my 
my filters are the different tube wells. I test out a bunch of tube wells and figure out where I want to where I want to test them. And I start I start going through my routine. I would go every day, kind of test the tube wells, collect samples, run the samples, figure out the results. And over time, you start growing a little a little crew. <laughs> they start following you behind and <laughs> constantly asking you questions. What's America like? What kind of childhood games do you play? What's in the blue box? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what actually ended up happening was we had very serious conversations about my research. You know, here these kids had actually grown up their entire life with arsenic. They've seen the results with their parents and their grandparents. They know what happens. So to them, this is a very real problem. They can actually have a conversation about this problem. Of course, we would play cricket in the afternoon, and that always helps. <laughs> but, but, um, but this conversation continued to the point where I actually overheard Rupa talking with her father about the research. And she was talking about the filter and saying, you know, Dad, this is, this is just like the, the, the plants we have out in our field. We go out there and we fertilize the fields. The, those plants absorb the fertilizer. They become big, strong, tall, crunchy, and, uh, and delicious. And the father said, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So these plants actually do absorb the arsenic. And she says, yes, yes, absolutely. And so then I started hearing that the, the people were not, no longer calling the plants filters. They were actually calling it an arsenic bagan, which means arsenic garden. And then we started getting approached by a bunch of adults who would say, actually, uh, you know, I have a, a tuba that I just dug, and I want to know just how poisonous this is. I want to know, you know if your filter can come and, and service my, my, my new tube well. So we started building that into the schedule. You know, we'd go test the go test the tube wells, go test the filters, then go test someone else's people's filters. We'd squeeze it in somewhere between testing the filters and cricket in the afternoon. And, uh, and then eventually it became unscalable. You know, we, I couldn't just do it all. So then I started training a bunch of other villagers, and then they went in around, and eventually we were able to, to test close to 500 filters. And then the villagers actually identified where they wanted the filters to go. And they said, well, actually, if we do this, then we can kind of then we can kind of all work together and use that same clean drinking water. And they were a part of the decision-making process. They were a part of that technology adoption. And so very slowly, the, the, the research shifted very far from science and very much towards social science. And it became this, this dialogue in between myself and the, and the villagers, and, and they were very much a part of that decision. So now we're left with a product that actually has a non-zero-sum game. Not only do we have health and environmental benefits, we also have economic benefits. It's a very rare situation to be in. These people can actually grow their own filters. They can even use recycled products to, to house the plants. Right? And then they can, over time, actually recuperate that cost, generate income. And all the while, they can live happier and healthier lives. It's very rare that you don't have a trade-off between economics and environment, or economics and health. This is a very rare situation to be in. And I'm very excited about the future that this project holds. I'm excited to see where it takes us. But when I actually look in the future slightly further, this isn't actually what the people want. They don't want to go filter their water. They want this. They want clean surface water. They want piped infrastructure. They want a household top tap that you and I benefit from every single day. Right? And I think that it, that's a really important thing to think about. What is the future that we would like to create, and how can we get there? And I think the first step is thinking about the world and the vision that the world has, right? Knowing the world around us, the world that you and I live in, the world where 40 billion hours are spent going and collecting water. That's equivalent to the entire population of California working full time for an entire year just to fetch water. I'm talking about a world where if this were India, 200 of you, this entire section, would be forced to defecate in public, have no access to the toilet. I'm talking about real problems that need real solutions. They need really good, pragmatic solutions. And we, should be we should be teaching our engineers and our scientists to solve these problems. But I don't think it actually stops there. I think that we should actually invite a larger group of people. It shouldn't just be the scientists and the engineers. We should actually invite the children and the young people who dream big, who ask tough questions, and actually can, are, they are capable 
of, of dealing with these tough problems, these very real, tangible problems. And I think that every good idea starts with a dream. And you never know which dream is going to snowball into an unexpected innovation. Thank you very much.